uh, with that, um, are we good taping team? Awesome. So uh, here for your first talk of the day is uh, Eric Ambrust and Trey Hare uh, on making millware. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. How's everybody doing? Yeah, it's all right. This is the hangover chair you've been looking for. <laughs> all right, we're going to talk about stuff. Um, so this is making millware and interdisciplinary trysts. Why the hell is it called that? Uh, what we attempted to do about a year ago, I'm a political science student. Erica is a computer science student. These two things are usually like oil and water. They don't mesh really well. There's different value systems in the discipline. There's different intents for what we're trying to explain. And there's radically different methodologies. So what we were trying to do was to come together and explain, or try to, if there is a consistent differentiation between state-authored code and non-state-authored code. Right. We are trying to get past the sort of apt moniker for everything. My interest was not in the tech initially. Right. Looking at platforms like Dooku and Turla, Flame, and Stuxnet, I wanted to be able to see if there were implications from that states were building these sorts of advanced espionage platforms more consistently, that this was becoming a legitimate tool of state interaction with each other and with non-state groups. The thinking was that if you could establish that there's a differentiation between state and non-state stuff, you could then start to do work on what the implications of that were. Right? I was not interested in you know, the behind the scenes. But as we went forward, that actually became the really interesting part. So making nowhere and introduce my interest. Oh, good. <laughs> I have to click it. OK, so who even are we? Yeah, I'm Eric Armbrust. Like he said, I like CS. I'm a junior at GWU, and I like assembly. Anyone else like assembly? Yeah. It's early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, my interest is, again, working with the policy dude to try and come to some middle ground where I can be like, yo, I know you don't understand what move EAX, EAX is. You know, useless, but still. it's ugh. So we want to try and come to some middle ground. And I figured, eh, I can speak some policy stuff. I may as well work with this guy. Cool. So and I'm Trey Herr. I'm a PhD candidate in political science at GW. Uh, I work with New America's Cybersecurity Initiative to try and do some policy-focused stuff. And I'm like a total neophyte translator type. Um, I help run a briefing series on the Hill. So you had Nick Larison up here yesterday. What we tried to do was to bring some of these concepts into the room with LAs and LDs and explain to them that cyber is not a thing. And we were talking about information security standards as an information assurance problem. It's different from when you're talking about cyber crime legislation. Right? And it's different from when you're talking about the CA system and how that gets governed. So we've tried to bring a little bit more nuance into that discussion, and this is kind of a continuing piece in that effort. So yeah, to start off with, Trey mentioned we want to move sort of past this whole app moniker. And the reason we want to do that is to sort of reduce our, our set of research, because apt covers a lot. You know, The person, the place, the thing, everything about the attack. It's an advanced persistent threat. That's kind of generic. So we wanted to try and reduce it a little bit to get some ground to cover and to come to, again, a middle ground where I can say, all right, well, I understand this about this subject, and I can tell you about it. Um, so what we decided to do with that is coin the term malware. Oh, yeah. So what are we talking about with malware? Military malware. Right. The intent is not to create a consistent, easy-to-use attribution tool. Right. That's not our game. Rather, we're trying to look at the architectural and behavioral characteristics of code to distinguish between different types of authors, not necessarily to tie to a particular author. We're not curious, we're curious less about the direct human interaction with the code and more about the product. Uh, for us to try and come up with a differentiable set of characteristics allows the policy community, right, in a language that they understand, to begin to frame the problem, right, in a way that's not just there is malware out there and it's this big, giant, massive stuff. We're trying to sit somewhere in between all malware is code and hey, look, I've got this really great in-depth analysis of a particular sample. So what we did in order, what we're trying to do in order to do that is to come up with a classification framework. And what this talk presents is basically a, a rudimentary set of characteristics that we have developed, sort of an alpha, to differentiate between these two sets of samples. All right, so our work on that is the MASS index, the Malicious Software Sophistication Index. Pretty good acronym. Um, so again, as Trey said, um, we wanted to reduce it and care more about how it's made, what it's made of, the individual parts of it, look at the malware, dissect it into sort of these modules, and try and come up with classification for if you see these things present, you know, it looks like malware, or it looks like malware, it smells like malware, it's probably malware. 
Um, so that's what our index does. It's you know not this super concise. If you see this thing with this score at this CVSS, it's gonna be malware. But something like, all right, well now we have a set set of literature that we can say, all right, well since it matches these uh, classification standards, it's probably gonna land in this ballpark. What we're not concerned about right now is target sets. Right? We think that's too easy to spoof. We're also not concerned with trying to tie the code to particular states. Right? It's likely that the cultures and the operating environment of a group of some of the intelligence organizations working within Russia and China have different objectives and are going to have different operational considerations as a result of that. We can't speak to that yet, though. Our sample size isn't big enough. Right? So what we're looking at right now is just across all state samples, these high-end sort of groups that we're trying to capture their capabilities of, their architecture and behavior. A really important note at the top. One, we're not describing battlefield capabilities. Right? This is less relevant for this group, but when you talk about malware, you end up getting into this mixed discussion between stuff that's being used at the strategic level right, and stuff that's potentially being deployed on the battlefield. So we're not getting into the battlefield side. The second, not all states build code the same. Not, not any group of state of groups, not any group of organizations is going to build code the same way. We're trying to capture the high-end set of capabilities that we see coming out of states like Russia, China, the US, and Israel. Right? This is a way to try and cluster those capabilities. It's an, it's an analytic shorthand. It's not trying to draw a really aggressive line in the sand and said, yes, over here we're operating in one environment, over here is radically different. Right? That's not the intent here. Yeah. So what even is it? It's a qualifiable metric to try and come up with a way to differentiate state and non-state code. It's not quantifiable yet. Right? It's not like a, a point-based score like the CVSS system. There are some drawbacks to CVSS that we'll get into, and it was actually kind of a pain in the butt to work with, but that's a, probably an issue for another talk. The other objective here is that this is a tool for policymakers, something that's intelligible to Nick or to another LA on the Hill, somebody in the executive branch, trying to craft a narrative for them so that they understand more about this problem area and it doesn't become, hey, read this 20-page Kaspersky white paper. Right? We're trying to give them a language, a, a semantic framework, right, to understand the sort of products that exist in this space and the differentiation that comes from when those products look different or operate differently. All right. All right, yeah, so as you were saying, we're trying to create a bit of a Rubicon or a Rosetta Stone of sorts where we can get some generalized language that me as the RE dude can be like, yo, here is the thing that I found. And the policymaker can be like, okay, I get that without having to, like Trey said, read through these massive white papers that they might not understand too well. Um, so, yeah, um, that's kind of what we're trying to do with this. Um, so the criteria that we started looking at within our samples um, was propagation methods. How did it get to the target? And once it infected the target's network, where did it go? How did it internally propagate? Where did it pivot to? Um, next, we looked at exploit severity. Um, kind of an obvious indicator. If it's using this O-Day that no one's seen before, odds are it's probably not Zeus. Um, and if it's using black hole, it's probably not sandworm. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to look at payload characteristics. This kind of matches with the internal propagation metric that we picked because the payload is for all your banks. However, uh, something more specific like Stuxnet, yeah, it's going to spread everywhere, but it's not going to infect everywhere. It's looking for this one specific target at this one specific place that it will do one specific thing in and then just die. So a note on that, right? We define propagation along two metrics, scale and specificity. Scale, it's trying to capture the broadest set of targets that this method employed can infect. If you set up a, a compromised site, you sinkhole, or excuse me, you uh, say the, the GAO site, right, that was used to target State Department, some other USG organizations, uh, I think it was last year, right? No, it was Department of Labor, it wasn't GAO, it was Department of Labor. Uh, the scale for this site are all potential users, all potential visitors to that site. The scale for a USB stick is substantially smaller, right? You've got to find the right organization, leave it in a parking lot, right, or get it onto somebody's machine. Specificity captures within that potential target pool the limiting factors that you built into the code in order to target a particular user or a particular network. Talk about Stuxnet. Stuxnet had a series of checks built into it in order to establish what the operating system was, the configuration of certain files, the presence of certain other pieces of software, specifically the HMI interaction stuff from Siemens, to understand what platform it was on and to execute accordingly. So scale captures the total possible target pool. Specificity is how you limit within that. One of the distinctions we make in the piece is between phishing and spear phishing. Right? Phishing is this sort of broad mass, little specificity propagation tool. 
spear fishing is a big scale, but the more detail you put into a particular individual, the guy who lives next to him, his coworker he emails with all the time, limits the specificity of that propagation method. All right, yeah, so when we were coming up with this, again, we wanted to try and abstract it up to a higher level, make it as generic as possible. We didn't want to say, all right, well, if you see this exact signature, it's probably going to be malware. Um, because again, policymakers don't care about signatures, they care about evidence. So when trying to develop this, we wanted to make that evidence as high level as possible. So going through stuff, we did um, a lot of RE, RE work on our samples, but we also matched that with reading a lot of white papers, reading a lot of technical documents, attacking this problem from both angles. It was a little bit um, hairy because we had to do the same thing twice, more or less. But by doing that, we came to a pretty good middle ground. Um, and another note about this is it does lend towards incident response. Like you need, um, while using this metric, to have an idea of what did it do? Where did it go? Like this is post-attack, post-exploit, post, oh my god, we've been pwned. Um, so it relies on some of this evidence to back up the translation. So, you know, Secret Service comes knocking on your door, you've been compromised. All right, well, was it from North Korea or a guy in Russia in his mom's basement? Right, so this gets into an interesting problem. It's kind of an interdisciplinary issue. When I was coming at this from political science, I was looking for something I could say, this makes a difference. These groups are different based on this thing. I don't care what the thing is, but I can tell you that they're segmented in some way. Based on that segmentation, I can then start to draw implications. Ah, look, we see the Russians engaging with these international organizations, but not these other ones. We see that there are reports of NSA looking to buy or having interest in certain companies, but not others. Trying to draw trends from the underlying distinction rather than being interested in the distinction itself. This was an initial and kind of interesting roadblock because trying to get political science people interested in the underlying characteristics of differentiation was really hard. Right? They're not comfortable with code. They're really not comfortable with information security in general, but that's sort of another problem altogether. Um, so us getting together was trying to say what methods matter to the question. And working on that question was probably the hardest initial part. What are we actually trying to do? It became obvious pretty quickly given the scale of the resources we had available to us, the number of samples we could get into, the amount of RE time that Eric could put into this project, that we weren't going to be able to come up with something that was a slam dunk set of tools that you could put into an automated uh, program, right, and turn around and say, oh, this is always malware, this is always malware, this is always malware, this is always malware. It's still a very manual process, it's still really qualitative. That's one of those areas of work we want to expand upon, but that was our sort of first cut at trying to focus on this question. Can we differentiate between state and non-state code? Given that, what implications are there that differentiate the behavior of state and non-state organizations? Cool. So yeah, to touch on Trey's point, we didn't have a lot of time. Uh, I was the one already in all this stuff. Um, I am a full-time student as well and work a job, so not a lot of time to dedicate to this, but it was something cool, so I figured may as well. Um, so yeah, average RE process, load it up in IDA, see what it's doing, throw it up in SysAnalyzer, see how it works, capture packets, all that stuff. Um, but again, the other part of it was attacking it from the upper level angle and saying, all right, well, we've got a bunch of these papers that's come out, because we picked some known samples that had been written on, that had been published, and we wanted to work from the bottom up and the top down, meet in the middle. Um, took a lot of time getting really in-depth technical documents because, you know, all right, I'm not an actual, like, malicious user. I want to read this because I'm doing research. Um, and all my IRC buds out there, thank you for the samples. Um, it was fun to get a hang on that because, again, not a lot of monetary resource. So it was pick and choose, see what we could get. Um, in the RE process, there is nothing super groundbreaking, but that's not why we're here. is good at what it does. So, yeah. Um, we wanted to keep it, again, high level. High level, that's the focus here. We want to bring all of this low level stuff up. Um, we tried to keep the data collection as open source as possible so that anyone could use this. It was very easy to get your hands on what we did, um, relatively speaking. And if you just got the papers using the framework that we came up with um, on some other samples that you might want to do research on, you could work strictly from uh, top to bottom and say, all right, well, I read this in these papers and I can see this behavior in these papers, even though it might you know, already lend towards Miller, I can verify that or I can understand that myself. Um, and again, we wanted to make it so no one needed to know assembly to actually use this. So, findings. They're pretty straightforward and they make a lot of sense. A lot of you probably already understand this. Um, when propagating to the target, malware, like Zeus, wants to infect everyone. It just wants to get all of your banking creds. So we were looking at a very sort of very broad propagation method. 
When it was trying to infect users, it was just using XSS, CSRF, really broad spear phishing campaigns that had little to no personalization. Your average uh, Nigerian king scheme. Um, and the severity of the exploits that we saw in those, again, they were like black hole exploit kit. They were these things that had been documented that were going into your grandma's unpatched PC from 1985. Um, so for payload, um, we saw again, Zeus is a botnet. It had a bot as the payload. It wanted to sit there, gather credentials, and move on. Um, and internally, again, once it got in, it just tried to look for hosts and infect them. It didn't care what they were. Uh, it doesn't really care, you know, is this an admin box or is this your grandma's computer? It just wants to get in. Um, so, moving on to the malware part, we saw pretty much the exact opposite. Propagation to target uh, was very, 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 very targeted, very specific. When it was a spear phishing campaign, it was targeting one, maybe two people, and it was just looking to get in. They had done a lot of previous research, they had done a lot of SE, and they knew who they were propagating this email to. And if that wasn't the case, and they were using an actual ODA to get into the system, they knew the system before they even started attacking it. Unlike Zeus, which just everywhere, um, these samples want to get into specific places and don't really want to be detected, for obvious reasons, at least when initially getting in. They might want to get detected later, but that's a different story. So, the payload for these things. They, again, very specific. The tool set that came with these pieces of malware were very, very targeted. The actual tool set that came with it was specifically for its motivation. If it was trying to get specific docs, like in Sandworm, it would only start gathering docs and exfiltrate. Nothing else. It might spread to a couple of other targets it wanted to, but that was about it. Um, if it was looking to cause mass chaos, it will start propagating sort of like malware does, but again, to everywhere with the sole intent of shutting things down, not necessarily gathering credentials for harvesting money. Um, so yeah, that was pretty cool. So there's some insight from this, right? One of the things that became interesting in looking at this kind of differentiation, how much effort had gone into the prior reconnaissance work in terms of the propagation was, you can start to have a follow-on assumption from that. How many, how much time Right, and how much resources do you devote to poking around a box before you actually try to pop it? And when you're looking at the state level and you're talking about moving between different types of networks or trying to crack a particularly hard target, right, the corresponding resource investment to do that goes up. The, the thing that we're trying to figure out from this, right, so to start to draw out one of those first implications is, if you are looking at a piece of code that is going to function largely autonomously in a set of complex networks with... Uh, non-commercial software, which is to say not in common use stuff, right? Thinking again about something like Stuxnet or Dooku, the amount of engineering effort associated with getting the details right about the network you're looking at, again, for me, is coming at this from political science, there's an implication for the size of the group that's involved with that, for their commitment to a particular target, for the amount of monetary resources and human capital that they're going to put into setting this tool in motion and refining it as they go. It's possible that as a result of that process, you would start to see exactly what you'd expect in any other complex industrial process, specialization and economies of scale. So if I have to do this sort of propagation to difficult networks on a regular basis, am I going to attack every problem as its own specific boutique issue, or am I going to start to build a specialty within my group, potentially take a platform that I can replicate across different targets, potentially take a set of capabilities that I could stick on a target just to may gain and maintain access for whatever I want to do in the future, right? Do I start sticking myself onto lots of boxes just in case I might want to come back for something later? This is the sort of behavior we're seeing with black energy, right? So I'm sure a lot of you guys have read the SANS report on uh, the Ukrainian power outage on December 23rd. Black energy has been found in a bunch of stuff here in the States. Most of the analysis has been focused on it as a, as a reconnaissance platform and as a way to maintain access. The analysis from Robert Lee, who's the Drago security guy who's been working for SANS, his write-up said Black Energy was the, way, was the point of access into this power plant. It did not allow, it did not facilitate a payload that was itself destructive. It really just gave somebody a chance to come in and start turning stuff off manually, right, which is its own security issue, but we're going to let that be the Ukrainian's problem for the moment. The implication here is I'm building tools to start to gain and maintain access to tons of different systems. We're not using the three-letter three word here, right? But that's a massive industrial effort, especially if you're doing it across multiple states and multiple organizations. So again, coming back, right? We can differentiate the operating characteristics between state and non-state code, potentially based on this propagation technique. And it has an implication 
in terms of the organization that gets built up behind it. One of political science's problems is we deal badly with stuff we can't observe. Right? We don't deal well when we don't have empirics, when we don't have data. This is a problem for everybody, but it's, it's a problem for us more because we don't always care. So there's some really crazy ass theory that's come out of political science people saying, we don't know, so we'll take a best guess. We'll just do what we can. Right? We're trying to solve that problem by tying what we're, what we're observing, what little we're observing, to particular implications rather than just taking wild guesses about what NSA is doing, what 8200 is doing. Right? We're trying to actually link this back to some behavior we can observe in the wild. Let's make our best guess better. Right. All right, yeah, so to wrap it up, summary of everything we found is pretty obvious. Malware is targeted, malware isn't. Um, and within that targeting, again, as Trey said, if malware is looking to spread, it's not looking to spread and gather. It's just probably going to be sitting there. Um, some takeaways. So malware is visibly targeted from step one. It cares about the target particularly. There, we don't see the wide scale and highly nonspecific propagation mechanisms. It's not scattershot. Um, it's looking for information about the network itself. There's a priority placed on internal identification, active directory credentials, um, particular user credentials that have high value within the structure of that network in order to move around in a way that's not going to trip internal uh, IPS systems, that's not going to potentially give its location away. So not just escalating privileges on a, on a basic user, but actually trying to get to a sysadmin and move around a little more seamlessly. And an important part is, this stuff's built for espionage. It wants to gather your information. It doesn't want your money. The guys writing this probably have a lot of money anyways. So it's going to look there, it's going to sit, it's going to listen. It might not do a whole lot for a couple months at a time, maybe even a year. And then all of a sudden, you'll just exfiltrate terabytes of data, and there go your state secrets. Right, so looking for high value targets. Mm -hmm. And then again, I mean, the, the terror notion's a little bit strained, but we're talking about the majority of these payloads are built for espionage or in some, some form of espionage and reconnaissance. Um, obviously, Stuxnet was destructive. There have been other examples of that, but there's not a ton of them, and this is not trying to bracket this just into stuff that's going to break things, right? We also care about the espionage side. Yeah. And like the other note on terror is, especially with IoT becoming the big thing, that's something that we're probably going to have to worry about in the near future. When cyber warfare actually becomes really hardcore, all right, well, we've got our power grid as IoT that's accessible to your neighbor's dog. Uh, we're going to put malware on that, and we're going to crash it. Not a fun time. Right, in your thermostat. Okay, so why does this suck? Well, we actually only RE'd four samples. Um, what we did initially was to look at Gauze and Timba. Yep. Right, went to Gauze and Timba, and the state samples were Sandworm and the code from the Sony attacks. We went back after that and looked at white paper and technical analysis for Red October, for Stuxnet, for Juku2 and 2.0, for Turla. And on the non-state side, we looked at Lomi's, Updater, or one or two more in there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, also, we only had one guy reversing them. So from a social science perspective, I'm saying maybe that's a source of bias. Maybe Eric really likes particular hooks and he's just focused on them when he's doing this stuff and we totally miss some other stuff in the code, right? One of the big efforts, I think, for us in moving forward with the process is try to automate this RE pipeline as much as possible to work that out. Yeah, because what we're doing, in a sense, is its own form of malware genomics. We're trying to create two separate classifications and fit this whole mess of samples into one of those. And then maybe even within those classifications, say, all right, well, we've got something for espionage and something for terror within malware. Further classify that stuff. And we need an actual good, rigorous platform to do this for these thousands of samples, because manually doing this by hand for thousands of samples, pretty garbage. Yeah, so that's, we'll get back to that genomics thing in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, so the other part was diff difficulty in acquiring live state-authored samples. Um, not it really shouldn't time. be shocking. Yeah, crazy, right? I don't work for DHS, so that's a problem for me. And even if I did, it'd be garbage. Um, so it's early alpha research. We had limited resources, limited time, but we did something pretty good. Right, we're trying to come up with this prototype. The big thing for us is building out an index we can start to refine. Right, trying to create a scalable infrastructure associated with this sort of differentiation. It's a framework that we hope will expand over time. It's not a single point in the universe. All right, so why even do this? Um, we have this policy versus practicality issue, right? We're trying to blend different types of research. And for us, that was a really interesting process. Part of, I have to give you guys the inside hint on this, right? Part of this came out of uh, a failed NSF proposal. NSF's the National Science Foundation. They fund different sort of silos of research depending on what discipline you're in. They also have this secure and trustworthy computing program that's intended to pull together social science and technical people. Problem one, NSF is super risk averse. They don't want to give you money until you've basically demonstrated that you've done the project, at which point it becomes like a chicken and egg issue. 
Second thing is they are, let's say, cautious uh, about work that uses novel methodologies. This is novel to political science. Why are you looking at code, Trey? You are not a computer scientist. Why are you talking about politics, Eric? You are not a political scientist. So we had some issues convincing people that both this could get done and it would be valuable to the respective disciplines. Right? Value to the discipline is a big roadblock for the academy. And we talk about this all the time in terms of inter just interdisciplinary work. How do you reward somebody who's in one discipline publishing in another? Great example of this, which I found out during this process, uh, political science cares a ton about journals. Our publications go into journals. They're, they're ranked. They're hard to get into. The publication timeline is insanely long. It's like 18 months. The respect accorded to publications is based on the tiering of the journal. Computer science, as I'm finding out, cares a ton more about conference publications and proceedings. So if I put something into Usenex, right, and it's whatever ridiculously low acceptance rate, it's great in the CS community. Political science people are like, you presented your paper at a conference. What do we care? Right? They, don't, they don't give a wit. So again, trying to come back and justify the value of this research was difficult. And the importance of doing this type of research is it needs to be done. There were panels and talks yesterday and Friday about, hey, we need political science and computer science to work together. This is an example of one way that it's possible. A very, very small example given, but one that needs to be done. This question of, all right, well, how do I say this is state authored? That's something that needs to be answered and understood by the policy guys so they can make the right policies to try and figure these things out. Like we say, app, your, your crypto is not an apt super conspiracy. We need them to understand that. They see code that looks scary and has a terrifying GUI and they think, oh God, we need to block all of that. That's not what we want. So this was a first cut, kind of a prototype of being able to demonstrate that this sort of analysis was possible and you could actually draw some useful implications out of it for both disciplines. Uh, on differentiating samples and techniques, there's a lack of a high level language. Right? There's been a lot of discussion about Wassenaar in the last six to 12 months, certainly in the last, the two panels yesterday. Part of the problem associated with that conversation was that there's a misunderstanding on the part of the policy community about what these tools actually do, right? They are not able to reliably differentiate between the Vitel stuff and the stuff that states are building if they have a problem with. Some of that might be intentional on Vitel's part, can't speak for him. Um, but what we're trying to do is come up with a better framework for them to understand and differentiate this stuff. I mentioned the Wassenaar issue, right? Modification of standard execution path of a program. Does anybody use, you know, plugins for Chrome or add-ons for Firefox, right? Or update code at all? So this is an issue, right? The community, the, the policy community doesn't understand and doesn't have to necessarily at a granular level what we're talking about, but it comes up with crap definitions like this as a result. So is there a better framework, a better language then some 32-year-old political science graduate who has never seen a piece of code in his life trying to like intuit a definition, right? This is a way to try to move that forward. This isn't the product for it. The end result isn't gonna solve that problem. But trying to build a community of scholarship that's able to work in this interdisciplinary fashion hopefully will get us down that path. All right, so what does it all mean? We, got, we talked a lot about policy implications. Can I draw some of these out? The premise is that states are doing, starting to do this more and more. The implications of that first is that it's not going to be a bespoke process for them. They're going to industrialize the process because it's what you do anytime you're confronted with a repeated set of complex problems. Just like military, military industrial complex, we're going to try and do this with malware. Right. Malware. And I, I think we're starting to see that, especially within the contractor community. And some of you know more about that than we do for sure. And if you're interested in talking with us, we would love to hear from you. So some implications. First, states appear to care less when you dox them. Right. There's a sort of ongoing trend of sort of FUD, sort of marketing, sort of insight that gets pushed out by the InfoSec vendors. When they find something cool, they take it apart and they tell it to the world. Give it a sexy name, talk about all the stuff it does. Uh, with some of the non-state groups, they react to that. With the states, less and less. It doesn't seem to impact their overall mission set and their willingness to operate in particular targets. They may re-attack, they may reinfect in another way. In some cases, they just don't move at all. Um, that's, that's problematic because that's a potential tool for the InfoSec community to combat these sorts of threats doesn't seem to be working. Second, states are breaking trusted infrastructure more regularly than non-state actors. Part of that goes back to that resource advantage. The number, of, the number of code signed state samples is substantially higher, vendor signed state samples is substantially higher than non-state groups. That has an implication for that signing process as a chain of trust. It's also an issue for the CA system. Right? When CAs become compromised on a regular basis by sorts of these processes, it's an issue for the rest of the community because we stop trusting that infrastructure if we know it can be compromised. It's not that this hasn't been done before. 
right? Zeus compromised Adobe's internal certificate signing infrastructure, right, in order to get past IDS systems. That's happened before, but it's more common with state samples. It's a more regular issue, right? The, we've, all, we've all read about Flame, right, and the MD5 hash collision that they were able to generate in order to use the Windows updating system. It's, a, it's kind of a sexy propagation method, really. Um, but if that stuff becomes more common, we're going to stop trusting vendors and their update processes in the same way. So that has a downstream implication. It has a policy implication. Uh, third, this stuff will proliferate. We're not saying that all malware is the sexiest, most advanced stuff out there. But we think generally that the code embedded in these platforms involves more novel techniques and compromise methodologies than the stuff you see from non-state groups. That's problematic if it gets out in the wild. All this industrial process we're talking about, where states are working at scale and spending lots of money trying to come up with new ways to gain and maintain access to these systems, if it's trickling down into the non-state community, means that they are funding the same research and development that gets used against banks and gets used against individuals. The true type exploit in Dooku, right, that kernel level file parser vulnerability, was found less than a year later in the Blackwell exploit kit and in the, I think, the cool exploit kit, right? A month after, or excuse me, six months after that, it was like in half a dozen kits. Julia Wolf at FireEyes did some really good research on this trickle down problem. Research issue. The community is certainly in the, on the political science side, the security side. We don't understand how to categorize this reuptake process very well. We don't have a good set of metrics for how complicated something would be to take and recombine. So a policymaker gets up and says, whoa, Stuxnet, we put it out there. Now everybody's just going to grab it and start blowing things up. Like, all right, man. This stuff is really carefully designed to those Siemens PLCs, down to the config files that it's looking at. Right? It's this carefully engineered platform trying to create a very specific set of effects. So yeah, you're going to pull its exploits out and probably be able to use that in your own code. But the payload is not just a drag and drop problem. And understanding that differentiation is important for the policy people. And the other aspect to it is doing sort of a long chain of understanding this differentiation. All right, well, we have this specific example of Stuxnet. What happens when you drag that over long term? You've got multiple samples of malware coming out where you see this uh, differentiation happening, where it sort of trickles down to the malware. Over a long term, multiple years maybe, how do we see that impacting the malware markets? How do we see that impacting the code that goes out? How do we see that impacting the exploit kits that go out? Um, if you don't have this sort of long term quantifiable evidence to say, all right, well, it might not necessarily be that bad, or while this is garbage, please stop, the policymakers might not really care too much. I mean, right. Trey can attest to that more. No, it's absolutely true, right? So, forth from that, if states are doing this more regularly, they're spending more money on it. And if that scales, that creates a potential problem where it's in their interest, again, to try to create a cost-effective means of gaining access to systems. That might mean compromising existing operating systems and major software distros. That might mean as we've seen, potentially, introducing systemic vulnerabilities into commonly used platforms like, I don't know, a VPN. So that's an issue for us. As a community, understanding how these standards are promulgated and potentially compromised, realizing that these are areas of interest for major state organizations. Right? We have a lot of insight into the US, but other states are definitely doing this without question and potentially at greater scale. So understanding how consistent that differentiation is allows us to start to paint a more empiric picture about what's actually happening. How common is this state use? And last, man, it's really hard to arrest states. I don't know if you guys have seen this lately, right? Department of Justice, a year and a half ago, indicted five members of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. They were connected to some of these espionage platforms that came out. This was likely to work, right? We've all seen they got hauled up in front of Judge Judy, slapped on the wrist, and then were thrown in jail. No, right? You can't arrest these guys. It's difficult. It, it hinges on a really simple problem. The state, we assume, is a legitimate and legal actor. So it sort of flips the hierarchy, right? Where one day we're going after non-state groups who are, de who are illegitimate, right? We're tracking them down. Them getting exposed to sunlight's a problem for them, right? They want to be secret. They're sort of hiding in the corners. Now, we're talking about the very institutions that give us the legal basis to do this. We've got the sovereignty problem. Absolutely, right? When Microsoft took down the Rustock botnet, they had to do it in conjunction with the DOJ because there were a great deal of concerns on their part about what their liability would be on the part of taking this stuff down and grabbing potential legitimate users. So they had a lot of convers now, you know, we can have a we can have a debate about whether or not that was a legitimate act and, and what the associated legal issues are. But the, the key nub is they worked with the state, because the state gave them the legal authority and the cover to do this. Right? They worked out what they thought was the best manner for it. The state's the legitimate actor here. And now they're writing code, not now, but they've been doing it for a while, but they're doing it at scale. So how do we combat this as a threat? Right? We have to change the sort of paradigm that we're thinking about with these groups. So where does it all go? Have you heard the term framework lately? 
Has that been discussed? I think it came up 50 times yesterday. How do we talk to Congress people, to NSC staff, to CISOs, and communicate this distinction to them? And more importantly, use this as the basis to communicate this implications to them. This is a rudimentary attempt to try to come up with a sort of semantic framework, right, to describe the architecture and behavior of code that's differentiable between state and non-state actors. That's the intent. It's a big box that we're trying to fill with interesting indicators, and it's going to change over time. But part of that process is coming up with the language, right? This notion of a propagation method, an exploit, and a payload as sort of a framework to capture malicious software. It's a really rudimentary model. All, mentals, all models are bad, right? But some are useful. So it's an attempt to try to capture those characteristics in a way that doesn't require us to throw code at somebody who's not going to be able to understand it. ID the products, right? Crafting a language and trying to develop useful analytical tools for the community around those issues. So we talked a little bit about genomics before. More samples, much data. Wow, insights. I'm such great. Um, what we want to do with this is to expand it dramatically. Right? We talked about this being a box we want to fill up with stuff. Four samples, not enough. Not enough, right? And, and that's a, yeah, not enough for sure. Um, phylogenetics, malware phylogenetics, the sort of consistent tractable RE work over a family of code to trace changes in features and capabilities over time is for us sort of the, the next step. It's the nice and interesting step. We want to be able to do two things. The first is change feature change, trace, excuse me, track feature changes in code families over time. We'll want to see the evolution of code. Right? That's not a novel issue. But we want to start to do it with states. Take it out of this, wow, look, I found something really cool and it's a single isolated instance and start a look over time at trends in behavior, at trends in feature choices. The second is if we can do that, we want to start to trace diffusion of code between families. Right? So when Zeus was leaked, right, it got turned into and was taken, different parts of it, into a number of different samples. Car brokers built a lot of it right, on, on the original Zeus source code. We want to see if those trends exist and to what extent between state and non-state samples. Two reasons that's interesting. First, like we talk about with Dooku, it's bad if states are doing a bunch of really cool R&D and it's trickling down to non-state actors. It creates a sort of low-cost bonanza for them. But the second is it might be, and this is a policy implication, right? It might be that states are intentionally giving this stuff to people. The relationship between some of the criminal groups operating out of the Ukraine and the Turtle platform, right, is open to question. There's a researcher at Harvard who believes that the Russians are using these groups as outsourced research and development organizations. Right, where they essentially get, in, in exchange for legal protection, because they're the legitimate actor, they get first look at any new R&D these groups are doing. Right? And they can kind of exchange that back and forth. Maybe it's a six month window, maybe it's 12 months, we're not sure yet. Part of the problem is a data issue. We haven't seen those samples in a long enough track, right, collected somewhere where we can trace those features over time to be able to establish those relationships. And the important part to this is automated analysis. If we just diff the samples over time, that's going to be pretty garbage. There needs to be an actual rigorous framework that we can use to say, all right, well, we've got this 10,000 samples of this one family. Let's see when these samples came out, what changed, and try and modularize it and say, all right, well, this chunk of code does this. This chunk of code does this. This chunk of code does this. When we've got this stuff coming in from the Miller samples that we've got, we say, all right, well, we saw a major change in this chunk, let's say the exploit kit, because, you know, that's what it does. Um, we want to say, all right, well, we see over this span of time, the actual government Miller samples coming in are making this, as Trey said, a low-cost bonanza. So the other implication for this, or the other issue is, uh, because we're premised on restricting the activity of non-state actors, the existing institutional tools that we have out there, the Wassenaar is a great example, those are tools designed to solve problems in the traditional realm. Wassenaar was originally developed to restrict the sale of dual-use items like machine tools, advanced metallurgy components, right? Prevent people from building the next nuclear weapon or from building really sophisticated weapons on their own. The problem with that is it's mostly premised on the activities of non-state groups like commercial firms. It's difficult to apply something like Wassenaar, even with its crap language, to a state. It has no enforcement mechanism. It has no verification mechanism. It's an entirely voluntary framework. So we get up and say, if states are using code in such a way that it starts to proliferate capabilities to non-state groups, that it creates a, a more systemic insecurity for organizations, what's the problem there? Can we build an empiric basis to go to a policymaker and say, your issue is that you need to restrain your own behavior. You need to restrain the behavior of your neighbor. But we can't do that as non-state actors. Right? That's going to be hard for an IETF-like process to get together and find consensus 
Yes, we all agree we're no longer going to build sophisticated malware. Okay, that problem solved. RFC it up. We're done. All right. So we're trying to come up with a new way to speak in that framework, to speak in that language. States interact in that different fashion. And then the, the third piece of this is can we tie families to particular actors and start to model their decision making. Um, we talk about the malware market and it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a framework we put on these interactions between people like Revon and Vupen, right, and these different brokers and parts of this community. But there are market-like behaviors, right? There is specialization that takes place, right? People focus in to build particular products. There are pricing mechanisms. There are reputation mechanisms. So there are some market-like features to these interactions. What we'd like to be able to start to do is, is differentiate the decision-making of a low-end criminal group, of a high-end criminal organization, of a state. Are they buying differently? Do they choose to build their own or to try to grab from somebody else to buy something off this market? What's the decision-making process look like? So, really quickly, uh, at the end, shout out. Can we have friends? Um, we are working to try and expand this. We're trying to pull together some private funders, some academic institutions. We really want to sink this home at a university and build it out as not just a research program, but to start to talk about and work on the culture within the social sciences and computer science to do this sort of stuff, right? The Weiss community, right, the information security economics guys, and the hardcore, I would describe, right, security engineering groups, there's not enough communication there, but there's good work being done on both sides. We're trying to put it in conversation with each other. So, if you have time, if you have access to samples and data, if you have tools that you think would be interesting for us to use, or you have a high limit credit card or permission from your parents, we would love to talk to you. We are, we are open and willing to engage. We want to hear from the community, both in terms of what works and what doesn't with this framework, what stuff is going to be new. We know this is going to evolve over time. Right? This box is going to shift. The, the non-state and state code evolution problem is going to be right, a horse race down the line. It's something that's going to have to get updated every six to 12 months, no matter what. But the more data we can have access to and the tools and the infrastructure that we can build out to do that consistently will make this possible over time. This was an alpha. We want a beta and more. So if you have questions or comments and like want to come hang out, we want adaptive feedback. Please. Come and talk to us. Yeah. So questions if you got. No, it's totally, it's totally a valid question. Ah, sorry. So, uh, Wassenaar has this confusion in terms of commercial applications. Why not use something that's specifically related to states' behavior, limiting states' behavior in the Geneva Convention? The issue with Geneva is not the principles. The issue with Geneva is the enforcement. Right? So, we have built institutions around the Geneva principles to enforce them in different areas. We don't have that yet for the space. But taking that idea right, would be a novel thought here. So, I think that's, that's the sort of conversation we want to try to get going. Yeah. All right, there is a mic. If you have questions, please step up to it. But if not, you can also stay in your seat. I'm happy to repeat them. It's right here in the center. The long walk. <laughs> we don't want to repeat it. So obviously, attribution is hard. Uh, there are a lot of groups that kind of fall in the middle. Either you have like Sony hack where uh, Kim Jong-un is like definitely not us, could have been a quasi, you know, sponsored group. Um, you have non-state actors who have cyber armies that don't really have the same, you know, you know credit card uh, capabilities of a real state actor. Um, and then you have, you know, you could have a guy who worked on Turla for five years, but in his spare time he does crimeware. He can't unlearn that source code he's been working on. So it seems like it would be really difficult to, to find a way to kind of signature uh, that kind of stuff. So how does your model kind of account for those quasi cases? Yeah, so for the first iteration of the model, we didn't really focus on attribution. We didn't want to say this sample is specifically from this dude in Russia. Um, this was just a very basic intro sample uh, or framework of what is malware, what is malware. But continuing on, that's something that we definitely would like to tackle. Um, but we can't necessarily say, all right, well, we see the same patterns in the source code throughout these different samples. To get a better, and again, keeping it high level, more rigorous understanding of this, we need to tie these sort of diffusion times with actual real world, ev real world events. We'll give you an answer on a different tag, right? 
the, the trends and behavior of the individual like you're talking about is a fingerprinting problem, and that's definitely part of the existing set of attribution tools. But the discussions that we've been having with individuals in this community is that that's easier to spoof than we'd like to talk about, right? Language settings on keyboards, times these guys were compiling, languages, right? It's not, it's not as useful. So the, the one answer is it's going to be hard to overcome that, right? There are always going to be edge cases of guys who are right in a day job for a contractor somewhere and then coming home and writing their own stuff. Maybe an intern for FireEye is writing malware. We don't know, right? <laughs> that's, an, that's an issue we're going to have to deal with. But the bigger problem is, and, and the thing we're trying to capture is, by looking at the architecture of the platform as a whole, rather than the uh, stylistic fragments and particular pieces of it, we think we can account for that. Because it speaks to resource decisions and operational considerations less than your own personal flash. Yeah. Any other questions or hands? You guys have a wonderful audience. We appreciate the little hangover thing is kicking around. We hope you've jump-started your brains a tiny bit. Um, again, and we really would love to talk to you guys about tools and data. Uh, this is something where I think there's an opportunity to really pull together a group working on this sort of stuff. And it's not just going to come out of my uh, department. It's not just going to come out of his department. So we'd love to engage with you guys. Thanks much for coming here this morning. Enjoy the rest of Shmoo. See you guys around. Woo!